As the Director of Community Services for Humanist UK, Teddy is responsible for the strategic development of Humanist UK services in education, pastoral support, ceremonies, and other aspects of supporting the community in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. He's also responsible for development of research and pilot projects to promote the value of Humanist UK's services and to ensure their continued success. So on behalf of uh, Humanistically Speaking, Teddy, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, um, especially at this time when post-COVID groups are, some groups are beginning to uh, prepare themselves for, uh, for future greatness in their development and coming out of their, their shells. But before we go into that, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? When did you decide that you were a humanist and what was your past profession? So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you. Um, I think my, my story, as it were, um, I've certainly told a number of times uh, over the years to, to various humanist groups, but in my, uh, I was about to say past life, obviously I don't believe in past lives. Um, earlier in my life, I was an evangelical Christian, charismatic church, born again Christian, all that sort of thing. And I guess I came to humanism because over the course of my late teens, my 20s, um, more and more of the things that I thought I believed in as a Christian, I began to question to greater and greater levels. Um, I'm uh, an openly gay man. I came out when I was very young, comparatively speaking, certainly for the time in which I came out, which was the very early 90s. I was only 15. Um, and my experience within the church of being gay and being a Christian was not uh, always uh, a pleasant one. In fact, from time to time, it was a deeply unpleasant one. And it certainly had um, at least some something to play in my losing my religion. By the time I got to my early 30s, I really was done. And it just took the final moments and conversations with friends to break the cognitive dissonance in my mind of what I really did believe and at that point I realized that I couldn't identify anymore as a Christian I simply didn't believe in it I didn't believe in um, uh, in in an all-powerful God I didn't believe in Jesus Christ I didn't believe in various aspects of what Christianity was supposed to mean uh, certainly as I had been brought up I came just, sorry I, I, I just to kind of finish, I, for a couple of years, I was a very angry atheist um, and, you know, listened to a lot of angry atheist podcasts and videos and various other bits and pieces. But I found myself increasingly exhausted, um, firstly, by defining myself by something that I didn't believe in rather than something I did. Um, and just of not being able to pin the positive beliefs that I did have on something more coherent and, and substantive. Um, and I watched a, a video of um, Andrew Copson and Anthony Grayling in conversation with a couple of Christians about what I believe. Um, and listening to the two of them, uh, Andrew and Anthony, um, talking about humanism, the, the light bulb really did go on. And it was, yes, that's me. That's the set of beliefs I share. That's the best way of describing uh, myself. Let me ask you a straight question. Why was it important to you, Teddy? I mean, there are lots of people who share broadly those kind of humanistic views, but there's uh, a relatively small number who, who actually feel that it's important enough to, uh, to champion the cause, as it were. So why do you think it was particularly important for yourself? That's a really good question. I think there were a couple of answers to that. The first is that I wanted to understand for myself where I belong to have that sense of identity that situates me within some sort of context, to feel as though I was a part of like-mindedness, that there was a sense of fellowship with others that I could get on the basis of shared, uh, a shared worldview, a shared set of beliefs, a shared set of values, and for that to have some sort of word that describes it. Um, I'm somebody for whom uh, having a label, I think, is uh, a, a helpful way of explaining in a, in a very quick way the, the set of beliefs and, and so on that I have. Um, and so for me, that was all very important. The other reason that I think it's important, I have to say, I, I've come to a bit later, 
but I think it's really important as a symbol to others that I can describe what I believe and who I am and my identity by the use of a word. For a lot of apostates, for a lot of people who are seeking um, the ability to leave a high control religion or a religious community that is perhaps um, uh, not very happy and not very um, accommodating of people that want to leave those religions. To see groups of people with a belief system that is coherent, a belief system that is logical, a belief system that has around it a, a kind of a wholeness um, allows them perhaps to, to have a direction of travel so that they recognize that they don't believe in a set of things, but that existential question of, well, okay, I don't believe in the things I've been brought up in, but what do I believe in? Having a, not necessarily a role model, but having a label that one can look to, I think is important. And therefore it's important for me, certainly, that I get to say publicly that I am a humanist and what that means for me. So, I mean, that's really, really interesting. And I've got a feeling you're singing the song that lots of other humanists would would share um but you went one step beyond that i mean you had your own career uh you were uh i, I believe you started uh, life as a, as a teacher a music teacher you've also been in, in, involved in charities um but at some point you must have seen a job invitation uh to have uh, a very prominent position for Humanist UK. I mean, what's that about? Did you see an advert in The Guardian or did you know somebody? How did it start? So uh, when I when I realised that I, I was no longer a Christian and I, I sort of came out as, a, as an atheist and um, was looking around for the a more positive belief system that I could then identify with, um, I saw this um, incredible organisation where where everything I saw them them do, I agreed with all of the campaigns that they were engaged with. I agreed with all of the services that they were providing for people. I thought were amazing services and great opportunities for people like me who were looking for that sense of either fellowship or that sense of um, uh, need that that required some level of support. So LGBT humanists, defense humanists, um, young humanists for the for the younger. Uh, members and supporters and all those sorts of um activities and aspects i thought this is a fantastic thing so i joined and i became a member uh and i would look around on the website from from time to time and um look at the campaigns and go yes i agree in this this is fantastic this is self-validating this is an amazing thing and then i stumbled across the work with us uh page um at one point and saw that it was a, a job going and at the right. time i was a I was the national education lead for uh, Mencap uh, at the time. Uh, and I thought, if I ever got the opportunity to uh, not necessarily go and work for, but just get to meet a few of the people that otherwise, you know, it's very difficult to, to meet, um, that would be an amazing opportunity. So I went for it and for some reason I got it. I, I must say, uh, I must uh, share your view, in my experience with, uh, with the people at uh, Humanist UK, I, I've never worked with such dedicated people. It's a real pleasure, a real pleasure and an honour, really, to be associated with people like that. It's fantastic, um, and you can you can pay me the money later for saying that. Um, so, describe your present role with Humanist UK. Can you go into a bit more detail on that? Yes, of course. So, as the director of community services, I uh, oversee the growth and development of everything that is public facing that supports people. So uh, you've already uh, kindly outlined some of them for me. So um, ceremonies, fairly self-explanatory, funerals, weddings, namings, some civic uh, ceremonies like remembrance and those sorts of um, aspects, being there for people in the kind of greatest highs and worst lows of their lives and, and supporting the kind of ceremonial, ritualistic um, and personal aspects of, of celebrating mourning uh, those parts of our lives. Pastoral care, um, which is, you know, the, the sort of lower level emotional and psychological support for people in institutions. So whether that uh, institution is something like a healthcare setting, like a hospital or a hospice, um, whether it's a, a prison um, or a university, somewhere where they, the, the people who can't just get up and, and walk out the door, can't just 
walk away. Um, can have somebody to talk to who shares their worldview, um, who they can talk through some of the some of the crises that they're experiencing and facing in that moment. Um, I find this one a particularly fascinating um, and such worthwhile um, service that's often overlooked because you know, sort of, well, why wouldn't you just go to counselling? Why wouldn't you just go to whatever else it may be? And of course, a lot of chaplains, we don't call them chaplains, chaplain is a very Christian word with a lot of connotation and baggage around it. But um, a lot of the Christians, uh, a lot of the chaplains will say, well, we can provide that low level support to anybody, it doesn't matter what their religion or belief is. Mm. And to us, our, our contention, of course, is, if I'm in a hospice and I'm um, in the last few days of my life and I want to talk to somebody about the meaning of my life, I probably want to have that conversation with somebody who shares a view like mine, that this is the one life I have, that I don't believe in an afterlife, I don't believe in heaven and hell or reincarnation or the various other concepts of life beyond death. I want to talk about legacy and I want to talk about impact and I want to talk about the meaning of my life, knowing that it is bookended, knowing that it is going to end with somebody who not only gets it, but shares it and is able to empathize entirely with it. And then an, a range of other um, uh, services that we provide as well, like our Faith to Faithless program, support, uh, supporting apostates, people who have left high control religions, um, supporting them wherever they are and in whatever community and, and kind of stage in their journey that they're at. You've already mentioned education. Of course, we do a tremendous amount of work within education, supporting teachers, parents, schools and universities um, to prepare students. And of course, we support the students themselves uh, in getting a better understanding of what humanism is, what humanists are, our belief systems, values, and how we come to conclusions about uh, life and morality and all those sorts of things. Um, trying, to, trying to unpack the simple summation of what a humanist is, uh, is a very difficult thing for a lot of educators to be able to do. Um, and so we have an entire program that is dedicated to uh, unpacking that and being able to do that. Um, and of course, for people who want to engage in lifelong learning. So we have massive open online courses um, that just talk through, you know, th this is what a humanist person might do in these circumstances. This is how we live our lives and, and the decisions that we make along the way. Mm. And then there are a range of other community facing services that we have services, networks and programs of things like our dialogue network, where we engage with often religious people to better understand each other, to find the common ground, find the things that are um, irreconcilable and figure out how we live with each other in a pluralistic society. All the net, some of the sections and networks that I've already spoken about, LGBT humanists, defense humanists, young humanists, humanist students, um, the various choirs and networks of people who come together for common reason and common cause. And of course, the, the main topic that we're going to be talking about for the rest of uh, today, um, mm -hmm. local groups and branches, uh, those organizations that come together in order to provide fellowship, support, companionship and... Um, groups of humanists in local areas, in, in areas and cities or towns, um, where coming together and supporting each other means a lot to the individuals. I'll and come that's to my that, job. I'll come We're to that just responsible for all of those things, their growth yeah, and development. I'll come to that uh, in, in, in just a second, but just one throwaway uh, comment. I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, ceremonies. Um, uh, are there any updates or any movement on humanist weddings at all? It seems to be going on for a long time. Well, the pandemic hasn't helped matters, I have to say. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the latest situation is that the High Court case uh, last year um, found uh, every one of our arguments convincing. Um, every point that we made, uh, the judge agreed, was a point that illustrated the discrimination against humanist couples who want to have the wedding of their choice in accordance with their beliefs and only didn't go as far as to rule entirely in our favour because of the current Law Commission um, uh, investigation and um, consultation on reforms for, for marriage. However, I, and therefore, the, you know, the, the pandemic and the, um, the, the knock-on effect of uh, 
slowing down those processes has had that effect of us not being able to move as quickly as we'd like or the government I suspect um, or the law commission as quickly as they would like um, but that is really where it is the law commission is still finalizing its uh, consultation but the high court case made it very clear that to not um, give legal recognition to uh, humanist marriage was discriminatory against humanists and that the government needed to uh, to act swiftly in order to make sure that this, dis this discrimination doesn't continue. Well, that was about a year ago. Let's hope that uh, the pandemic doesn't get in the way of that uh, now and that things move further further forward. Indeed. So let's get back to the to the group's uh, situation. Um, uh, and humanistically speaking, is, is, is chosen June to present itself uh, for groups because it looks as though groups are going to uh, beginning to unfold again and beginning to open up. Some never closed, but some did shut down. So let's get on to that uh, that issue now. So what are the first issues to consider if, if, if anyone is thinking about starting up their own group? What advice would you have to offer? Well, the, the first thing I would say is, and I'm sure uh, those people who uh, lead local groups um, will echo my words. It's a lot of work. It really is a lot of work to, to start something up. And so the first um, pieces of advice that I would have would be to find out if there is already something in your area that you could go to to ask for advice, support, um, or even just, you know, if it is if it is close enough, go along and help out with that local group first and, and use that as a base from which to uh, build a sort of satellite or secondary uh, local group. The other thing is to not attempt it yourself. Um, mm. Such endeavours, whilst, um, whilst often local groups are driven by a very small handful of people who are extremely dedicated, committed, and put in a lot of work and effort. To do it by oneself is very, very challenging. Um, and so finding others to help along the way, even if it's just with fairly straightforward uh, tasks and you know, pretty administrative tasks, um, how are you going to advertise? How are you going to find people to, to join in and all those sorts of things? But they're all pretty practical, uh, pretty kind of logistical, you know, um, things to bear in mind in terms of the workload. In terms of the issue to consider when starting up, I think the principal one that, you've, that I would suggest is if one's going to set up a group, one needs to know what the point of the group is. What's its purpose? What's it trying to do? What's it trying to achieve? What's it trying to get out of the group? Is it the provision of fellowship? Is it a social networking space? Is it a group that promotes humanism or a better understanding of humanism in the local community? Um, is it a group that's set up in order to present interesting talks and speakers and those sorts of things? In some senses, it doesn't really matter which one of those it is, but I think it's so important to understand what it is you're trying to achieve by having the group rather than just setting up a group because you think you should have one. It does make it an awful lot easier to persuade people to join, to volunteer and contribute um, and to get involved if it's very clear what the aim of that group is and what they're going to get out of it. Mm. I also think that um, if you're considering a, a group, one of the first things you need to know is the, is the potential uh, for uh, members within your area and uh, one of the things that Humanist UK can provide to Humanist UK members is some advice on the on the likely potential of, uh, of other humanists. I mean after all you've you have members all over the country you know where they are uh, and if I was starting a group it would be useful to know if there were just 10 people in my area or if there are 150. Uh, so that but that's something that Humanist UK can can offer, I believe, to uh, to humanists who are members of Humanist UK. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. And if people were to take a look on our website under the uh, Get Involved and then Humanism Near You section, there's a whole range of pages of um, advice, support, guidance, um, and and more specific things that that we as a national organisation might be able to do to help. And um, I mean. You're quite right. It one of the things that can it can do is to tell that person roughly how many members and supporters we have within a 
10 mile radius or so of the town or city that, that you're hoping to have a, um, uh, a group. Mm. Um, it can also um, send out an initial email. If, if there's a reasonable chance that there are a reasonable number of people in order to make it uh, successful. And I think your point about the 10 or 150 is a very good one. Um, if you've only got 10 people in your local city who are our members and supporters, for a start, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean that there are only 10 or 15 humanists in the area, um, but it might mean that there is something else at play. Um, it might mean that you're, you know, you're in a city with a, a, a large transient population, um, like a, you know, some of the bigger university cities or often have people come and go um, pretty regularly. Um, and so understanding the, the, the population in which you live really well uh, might lead to not just using the number of members and supporters that we have as the proxy for likely support for a group. Um, but perhaps we'll come on to that in a minute, because if there are enough people, then we can send an email to say this group is being set up. Is anyone interested in, in helping out? We can provide leaflets or materials to, um, uh, to, get a, to get a group going in order to just you know, have things that they can hand out. We can also put you in touch with the sections and networks like Young Humanists that I was talking about earlier to maybe put on an event in the area and see how popular that might be. You know. Uh, when, of course, we can eventually go back to physical events, uh, we can do them online as, as much as we want, but there's no guarantee that you get the people from the area then. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of different ways in which we can help. And of course, one of the other ways is we can put you in touch with people who run larger um, groups who have got a lot of experience in, in putting together groups and what that might mean. And find a buddy, yeah. Indeed. I think that's a good idea. Um, I know from personal experience that there are quite a few people who are members of groups, but not members of Humanist UK. So can you say why they would, why they should also join a national organisation as well as join their local group? Um, yeah, uh, for sure. So like most organisations, the, there are different things that can be achieved at a local level and then at a national level. Joining a local level often, joining at a local level often means that you're able to influence very grassroots decisions, um, uh, make, you know, kind of representations to and persuade local officials, local policymakers, community organizations, groups, and, and so on, um, in, in kind of steering the conversation, uh, policy or service toward um, reducing discrimination against non-religious people and, and so on. But if you're also in favor of campaigns that are only able to be influenced at a national level, looking at legislation around faith schools, looking at bishops in the House of Lords, looking at assisted dying, looking at the various campaigns that the national organization works on, the only reason that we, for want of a better phrase, punch above our weight is because of, we have the support of so many members and supporters uh, of, of Humans UK um, that enables us to go to government and uh, policymakers from across the, the, the region's national uh, levels that, are, that enable us to say, look, we have a weight of people behind us that are, are keen to make um, uh, these things happen because they're discriminatory, uh, because, you know, religious privilege occurs in these areas. Um, and the support of a national organisation allows that to happen. Um, it's about understanding the, the, the movement has to operate on both a, a, a macro and a micro level. Um, it's the only way that we're going to make any, uh, any real and serious progress. And so being a member of both is contributing towards our eventual success. I think it's a very good answer. Thank you for that. So what advice can you give to those groups that are just coming out of their post-COVID shell? We hope that COVID is going to be... Uh, eradicated uh, or not eradicated but at least under control um, over the next uh, few weeks the government is making very encouraging announcements um, do you see any particular opportunities for humanist groups post-covid uh, yes and, and i think probably the biggest one that we have is a real opportunity for groups to to just re-establish what they're for that that point that i made about the you know if you're trying to set up a new group, what's the point of the group? 
for groups that have been long standing, it might be an opportunity if they haven't done it recently, just to touch base with their supporters and their members um, and find out if the purpose of the group still serves the members and supporters that they have. It might also be an opportunity to reach out wider than that to the other members of their community who aren't involved, who don't come along to events and talks and socials and whatever else it may be and find out why not and find out what would persuade them to to come along um, i'm a big fan in understanding the, the the data i'm a big fan in understanding what do people want out of the community groups that are available to them um, and this might be a really good opportunity for for some of the longer standing groups to to really grasp that that nettle of what are we for? Do we achieve what we are for? Um, and if we do, or if we think we do, how do we know it? Like how, who are we asking? What are we asking of them? And so on and so forth. We are a much more interconnected world. We have been doing things now online for the better part of a year and a half. And my suspicion is even though physical events will, a will be able to, to continue once sufficient, uh, group of the population have been vaccinated and the threat of the pandemic has lessened to a degree where it is possible there are a lot of people who have quite enjoyed things being online and there are a lot of people for a lot of reasons for whom physical events were tricky at best either because of timing uh, or because of care issues um, or because of mobility or work or whatever else it may be and so one of the things I would strongly advise is that if groups are thinking of returning to physical, they, they at least consider a hybrid approach um, and have some online and some offline. And the final thing that I wanted to kind of uh, suggest when people are thinking about coming out um, is, yes, there will be people who, who are vaccinated, but there will still be people who are not. Um, yes, the, there will be lots of opportunities to, to mix and socialize and, and you know, connect with other people in a, in a physical sense. But what goes alongside those is a series of risks that need to be managed. Um, and my strong um, suggestion, my strong advice is to assess the risks to the people that are going to be attending, to the volunteers of the group. And just make sure that you are happy with the level of risk that, that, that you're engaging in. And if you're not, not to do the activity. Um, the mitigation of risk is, of course, a thing that we should all be doing. Um, but given how strongly, um, how strongly, how seriously the consequences of not doing that, particularly for people with um, suppressed immune systems and, and all those sorts of uh, kind of complicating factors, the, the risks of, of not mitigating risks um, are, are profound and serious. Yes, you said that to me before. Um, and I think a lot of humanist uh, groups don't even, haven't even considered that, that issue uh, much lately. Um, but what advice, where can they get advice on, on producing risk assessments or making risk assessments? Would it be their local authority? So there are a number of different ways in which that can happen. Um, we at Humans UK have uh, created some template um, advisory risk assessments, which we've made available on our partner group um, uh, shared drive. Um, local authorities will have templates um, and on the government, the national government uh, pages, there are now a number of templates for a number of different scenarios, including um, events and ceremonies for um, uh, venues and, and, and a, a wide variety of things. Risk assessments is definitely something that um, a lot of community organisations weren't doing before the pandemic. And as soon as, as soon as it was written into the legislation that if you want to do a whatever, a, a ceremony, an event, um, Often religious groups, in fact, you know, um, if uh, if a church wanted to engage in um, uh, open its doors for worship, it had to have a risk assessment. If a, a, a mosque or a temple or it had to have a risk assessment. And, and the same is true for any of our events as well. You know, any community organization um, written into the to the guidelines and, and legislation for COVID. Um, it was very clear that you need to do risk assessments. If you've only got 30 people that can attend an outdoor event, well, 
how do you make sure that it's only 30 people? And that's the other side to it that, of course, a number of people tend to forget is, um, although this may not be the case after the 21st of June, but who knows? But up to this point, if there were more than 30 people um, attending particular events, it was against the law and people could be prosecuted. Risk assessments need to cover those sorts of things as well. You mentioned risk assessments uh, uh, available on the, on the partner group shared drive. Uh, is that likely to be made available to other groups? Well, it can be, but I don't know how we would do so, given that you need to be a partner group in order to access that drive. And what I wouldn't want to do is to put on, um, uh, is to make widely available a template that, it, that exists in lots of other places um, if it doesn't help the group that, that's going to take it on. If you're a humanist partner group, we've got a pretty good idea of the kind of activities that you're going to be engaging in, and the template speaks to that. If you're a different group who then just takes it from our website, say, well, those those activities may not match the the templated um, uh, risk assessment that we've provided. But we'd be very happy, and I think we have in several places on our website signposted to where other templates do exist. I mean, I'm not saying for a moment that ours is the, the best one by any means. Um, it's simply a, a, a template that, that has been designed for groups, um, for humanist partner groups. Um, but there are plenty of others that are available. How many, how many humanist partner groups are there these days? I know you want to expand on that, but... 55. It's 55, it's a lot. Okay, so what other advantages are there for a group in joining into partnership with Humanist UK? Well, the, there's the very practical sort of support that I've already been uh, talking about. We provide uh, materials, uh, we provide a web presence, um, we are able to promote and support the events um, and activities of the partner group through our own um, either website, um, events listings, social media uh, and other things. We can also provide some more bespoke um, support for particular activities within groups so if there is um, a particular campaign that a group wants to to work on that is the same as one of our campaigns we have a campaign officer that can help um, how to lobby your MP how to write to your MP how to get you know constituency uh, buy-in and, and all those sorts of things and um, as an organization we provide a lot of um, uh, forums um, a lot of sharing of ideas we organize a series of uh, training, including a, a conference to support um, kind of cross sharing and networking between groups. And, I, and we do see a big part of our role as facilitating basically the sharing of good ideas and best practice between groups. But the other advantage for the group, for the humanists involved and for the wider communities in which they situate in which they're situated is that by joining us as a partner group, the, uh, the local group becomes part of a national movement, it becomes part of a national conversation, it becomes part of something that is bigger than itself, which in turn is part of an international movement. We as uh, at Humans UK were founders or uh, founder members of, as in we were one of the founders of, um, and continue to play a huge and significant role in Humanists International. Uh, and the international movement that, um, for which that stands. And in fact, the chief executive of uh, Humanist UK, I'm sure uh, you know, Andrew Copson, is also the president of Humanist International. And it is a part of that, that bigger sense of, of movement and connectivity that I think is one of the reasons why we want partner groups to, to join in with us so that we can all lend our voices to something that is so much bigger than us. And if we think about the international stage and look at the treatment of humanists across the globe we're very lucky in the uk we're very lucky that apostasy isn't a crime that blasphemy isn't a crime that our mere existence as as people who don't believe in a god is is allowed um, there are plenty of people in plenty of countries for whom they don't get to experience those um i was going to call them privileges um, those basic human rights yes. that we get to enjoy. Yes, absolutely. So what, uh, what kind of undertaking does a group need to, to agree to, to become a partner? Can you uh, an idea of that? 
there's a fairly short um, agreement that, that we sign in with each other where um, the, the, the partner group agrees to lend its support to the, to the national campaigns and services that we provide um, in order to, to promote them and uh, to make them widely known within the area um, in which the group is situated, in return for which we promise to give the, the sort of support that, that I've already spoken about, you know, the, the materials and uh, web presence and promotion of um, activities and events. Um, obviously, our values need to align. They, they need to be, you know, good, solid, humanist values of respect and tolerance and, and uh, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, but most local groups that want to engage in being a partner with us, they have them anyway. Yeah. OK, well, uh, you've you've very generously answered all my questions. Um, are there any burning issues, any uh, any points? This is this is your uh chance really to to speak to thousands of humanists many of whom uh, don't belong to groups um but are there any any issues that you would like to um mention now in you know that might be of use or inspiration to people who are planning to start or thinking of starting their own group it's a it's a very good question and it's one that i i always find very difficult to answer i mean burning issues there are as many burning issues as there are humanists uh there are huge in number um so i'll confine myself I, I think to burning issues that are of particular concern and relevance to humanists um our public affairs team work tirelessly on a range of, of public affairs and i would encourage people to take a look at the current campaigns on our website um, and see which ones of those they think are particularly relevant to them, be it education, um, challenging the, the privileges of, of um, religion and belief, not only within education, but within general society. Um, we've already mentioned sort of legal recognition of uh, humanist marriages, an end to bishops in the House of Lords. All of those sorts of things are... Um, they're all burning issues for us as humanists because they are all in a variety of uh, ways. They discriminate against us because of what we believe in and who we are as people. I think if I might touch on something that we, we spoke about right at the very beginning, I think one of the things that I would like to see is an increase in visibility. I mean, a lot of non-religious people have a tendency to identify as non-religious or atheist or agnostic or whatever it is. And of course that's perfectly um, uh, fine and right um, and the individual gets to identify themselves in any way they wish to do so but there are lots of small ways in which the right of an individual to identify themselves gets taken away from us and I'm thinking here about phrases like all faiths and none being able to put tick a box that says nil or no religion as opposed to non-religious Lots of little ways in which our identities just simply get erased, uh, or it might muddy the waters of what kind of services we as non-religious people might expect. Thinking about things like pastoral care and um, the, the sort of services that require a like-minded approach. I think one of the things for, from my perspective that I would like to see, in addition to the supporting of the campaigns that, that we as a national body do, is I'd like to see every survey, every data collection point, and um, every set of tick lists that I have to fill in, I want to be able to tick a box that expresses who I am. And I want that box to be something that policymakers then get to use and recognize that there are a huge number of people who hold this positive, non-religious belief system, and it has a name. That's what I want. Absolutely agree with you, uh, Teddy. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think uh, also um, we have a message for the rest of the world, um, which is about humanism. It's about the good things about humanism. It's not about criticizing religions or faiths. It's about um, what we believe and what our what our fundamental values are. And I'm sure you share that that view. Absolutely. Um, but anyway, uh, it's been a delight talking to you. And uh, thank you very much for agreeing to, uh, to come online. Um, I, I'm going to close this interview now. Um, 
and um, look forward to uh, a reaction from our readers. And uh, hopefully there'll be lots of new groups springing up all over the country. So, Teddy, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me.